It's extremely common to see Roman soldiers wearing red in all forms of media, from movies to shows, games, comics, Halloween costumes, and even reenactments. The visual style is so ingrained in our own understanding that even derivative works use red to draw the connection to the ancient imperial power. But as is often the case with such things that just seem so obvious, it's useful to take a step back for a second and question our base assumptions. How much of this Romans in red phenomenon is real? And how much did we simply invent over time as a standard convention for how we think the Romans should look? In this video, we will seek to explore the answers to these questions. It takes a lot of reading to make these documentaries. This leaves me with little time to actually get through my growing library or explore other subjects of interest. I'm sure in your own busy life, it can be tough to do all the reading you'd like to. Thankfully, our sponsor Blinkist has a solution. Blinkist is an app that takes thousands of nonfiction books and uses experts to distill them down to their most essential ideas for you to easily digest with text or audio in just 15 minutes. It's a great tool for getting up to speed on a wide range of subjects and deciding which ones you definitely want to read in full. As an example, this episode had me going down the rabbit hole of learning how ancient people made their clothes, which in turn led me to the fantastic series A Matter of Taste, which covers how things like fashion have changed over time. Sucked in, I then had to listen to Queen of Fashion, what Marie Antoinette wore to the revolution while running errands. Without Blinkist, there's no way I would have explored these topics. It's honestly been a really helpful app that I'd highly recommend. You can check it out right now by clicking the link in the description below to get a 7 day free trial. In addition, the first 100 people will get 25% off a full membership. Enjoy! I figured we'd start by taking a look at some common examples from pop culture where we see the Romans in red. A favorite of mine is Rome Total War 1 and 2, which depicts the legions as follows. See also Rise, Son of Rome, and Assassin's Creed Origins. For shows, see HBO's Rome, Stars as Spartacus, and Netflix's Barbarians. For movies, see Gladiator, and any of the older Sword and Sandals films. But this isn't just contemporary either. Check out this painting from the 1800s, and this one from the 1600s. So yeah, we've been making Romans red for quite a while now. Let's now dive into our sources to get to the root of all this. As a heads up, in this section of the video, I'll be throwing a lot of raw data at you, but rest assured that in the following sections, I'll walk you through a more structured summary. Okay, let's go. Perhaps the best starting point will be to look at the artistic depictions made by the Romans themselves. We have a lot of these in the form of statues, gravestones, reliefs, and frescoes. Unfortunately, few have kept their colors, yet some still do. At Pompeii, for instance, we find a fresco of a Roman soldier at the house of Valerius Rufus. He appears to wear a light red tunic and a white and yellow cloak. Meanwhile, in Palestrina near Rome, we find an incredibly detailed mosaic depicting life in first century Egypt. Towards the bottom are a cluster of soldiers. Notice the white and salmon tunics, the yellow cloaks, and the yellow brown shields. Other artistic depictions we found seem to follow a similar trend. A particularly insightful source in these matters is the site of Dura Europus, a 3rd century Roman Hellenic Parthian settlement along the Euphrates. It was fantastically preserved by its dry environment and has yielded over 12,000 artifacts and several painted rooms. This fresco is particularly informative. It shows the Roman tribune Julius Terentius making a sacrifice alongside some officers and soldiers. Their tunics are white, their cloaks white or yellow, and their belts red or brown. In terms of actual gear, a couple shields have been found at the same site, including the shattered remains of a scutum. Here it is reconstructed. And there you have it, Roman red. But one data point does not make a trend. What about all the other scutums that remain? Yeah, about that. These things were made of wood and leather, and as such don't preserve well beyond their small metal bits and pieces. To my knowledge, only two other Roman shields have been found. One from Egypt is a Republican era infantry shield, and another from the Denham Fort in Doncaster is an early imperial auxiliaryman's shield. Neither have had their colors preserved. Perhaps our most complete visual evidence of shields comes from the Notitia Dignitatum, which describes army units from the late empire. These are extremely varied, with all sorts of designs and colors. Admittedly though, this is quite late in the Roman army's timeline and doesn't necessarily tell us much about earlier periods. As you can see, the remaining material evidence we have is quite scattered and not particularly conclusive. So what about our written record? Well, luckily we do have some sources that provide a bit more context. 
For starters, we have this broad claim made by Marshall in one of his epigrams. Quote, Rome wears more brown, Gauls red, and boys and soldiers like this color red. It's a bit vague for sure, but not a bad start. Meanwhile, from the Historia Augusta on the life of Claudius, we get a far more specific reference. The line in question states, quote, To this Claudius, you will give us salary two red military tunics each year. End quote. This is great, as it confirms the presence of such a thing as a red tunic. However, an important caveat here is that Claudius is a high-ranking officer, and thus his gear is not necessarily representative of the rank-and-file troops. For a better look at the broader appearance of the army, we can turn to Tacitus, who writes the following about Roman troops in the 1st century AD. Quote, the eagles of four legions were at the head of the line, while the colors of four other legions were to be seen on either side. Then came the standards of twelve troops of cavalry, and after them foot and horse. Next marched thirty-four cohorts distinguished by the names of their countries or by their arms. Before the eagles marched the prefects of camp, the tribunes, and the chief centurions dressed in white. The other centurions, with polished arms and decorations gleaming, marched each with his century. The common soldiers' medals and collars were likewise bright and shining. It was an imposing sight, and an army which deserved a better emperor than Vitellius. Two important things here, obviously. The first is the mention that legions can be distinguished by their colors. Though color of what isn't clear. Are we talking tunics, shields, flags, or a combination of all three? The second point is the mention of the white tunic worn by the command structure all the way down to the senior centurion. This leaves a gap, however, for the common foot soldier. For this last piece of the puzzle, though, we can turn to the pay receipt of a Roman soldier at Masada. The papyrus fragment basically records how much of his ordinary pay will be deducted to cover mandatory expenses like food and clothes. The last line item mentions a tunica alba, or white tunic. Again, however, this is but one small data point. Beyond this, we have some scattered sources talking about colors sported by various figures. Almost exclusively, these are men in high-ranking positions. At Cannae, for instance, the Roman commander reportedly raised a scarlet tunic above his tent to signal battle, while at Pharsalus, Caesar raised a purple tunic. Elsewhere, leaders are said to don all kinds of colored cloaks as symbols of their status. There are a ton more historical snippets which I could potentially trot out and which we could examine one at a time. However, at this point, I'd like to transition over to the summary portion of the video, where we can discuss the conclusions historians have drawn from all this data about Roman outfits. Because we're dealing with 1,000 years of history, we will break things down by era. Rome's earliest history during the monarchy and early republic had the least amount of standardization. Soldiers were organized roughly by age and property class, and thus came to battle dressed according to their means. So if there is a connection between wealth and color, we should probably spend a moment to talk about this. It turns out that the study of ancient pigments has actually seen a lot of academic interest, raging far more broadly than just the garb of soldiers. For the purposes of this video, we can just dip our toes in by taking a look at the method of production in question. This began by first producing the raw materials, wool yarn and dye, which would then be mixed together in a vat, sometimes with a fixative. The desired hue of the textile came from using one or more pigments. These would have been extracted from some organic or mineral source, through crushing, drying, boiling, or other means. Roots of the matter plant, for instance, have long been used to produce a shade of the color red. It was simple and cheap to make. We know that the Romans used it widely, and that even British soldiers used it as late as the 1800s. However, matter was usually a lighter tone and could be considered a lower tier product. To get a richer, crimson red that popped and didn't fade as easily, you would turn to the Kermes dye. It was derived from the dried bodies of insects, which can be found on Mediterranean oak trees. Other red dyes could be achieved using mixes with mercury and lead, which produce brilliant and long-lasting colors. Yellow could be made from weld, saffron, pomegranate rind, turmeric, and a number of flowering plants. Blue could come from snails, mollusks, woad, and various indigo-bearing plants. Green could come from a small selection of lichen and plants, but were mostly a mix of blues and yellows. Meanwhile, browns and blacks often came from various trees, nuts, and metals. And lastly, we would be remiss not to mention purple. It could also come from a variety of individual sources or mixtures. 
However, one of the most prized versions were the royal purple variants, which were extremely rich in color and long-lasting. The Tyrian dye came from a family of sea snail, with each creature yielding but a few drops of usable material. It was a highly labor-intensive process, often involving multiple cycles of coloration. The end result varied from place to place, but generally appeared as a dark red or violet, which could even border on black. Once you had your wool and pigments mixed, you would then lay it out to dry, sometimes repeating the process several times over. Finally, the threads would be woven into the desired article of clothing. Obviously, the price would go up as you used rare colors and higher thread counts. Thus, the poorer ranks of the early Roman army likely wore plain tunics of undyed gray, beige, and brown. Those with a bit more wealth might add a few threads of color to the tunic in the form of patterning or hemming, while others might try and get the whole thing done in one of the cheaper hues. The further up the ranks you went, the more elaborate the coloring. To get a sense of this, we can take a look at the frescoes of the neighboring Etruscans and Samnites, who would have dressed relatively similarly. Thus, in this early period, we could have expected to see soldiers donning a range of tunic designs without much in the way of uniformity. The same can be said when it came to cloaks and shields. Admittedly, many historians speculate that there may have been some tendency towards using the color red. The first argument is an economic one, as the modern dye we mentioned previously was quite cheap to produce. The second argument for the use of red comes from the color's religious association with the important war god Mars. The third argument is that red simply appears to be a martial color seen across many cultures owing to its striking visual nature and connection to blood. As we get into the Republican era, things start to change however. The Roman army grew increasingly organized with more matured standards and practices. Yet still, the legions were not a permanent professional force. Armies would be routinely raised and disbanded, which meant that they remained rather hodgepodge in nature without a truly unified esprit du corps that you'd see in later years. Troops, therefore, would largely not have adopted a widespread uniform. At the start of the period, for instance, soldiers still provided much of their own gear, which was of a cottage industry nature. But by the end of the period, though, as armies served for longer periods of time and further afield, their kits started to be mass-produced and provided for them. Thus, the look of these Republican-era soldiers was slowly transitioning over the years. Broadly speaking though, it seems that there emerged some sort of expectation that soldiers would have tunics for various occasions. It appears, for instance, that soldiers had a casual fatigue for everyday use, a formal tunic for special events like reviews, religious ceremonies, and triumphs, and a battle tunic for combat. Yet still I say this with much hesitancy. It's not clear how standard this was, nor what sorts of colors would be accepted for each situation. Some have speculated that the casual fatigues were likely the simplest, with undyed or cheaply dyed wool. This seems quite reasonable, as they would see the most wear and tear, and would therefore require the most cleaning or replacement. When it comes to the formal tunic, some evidence points to it being white. This relates to ideas of purity, as with the use of the white toga candida used by candidates running for office. However, a white outfit also was a sign of some wealth, as achieving that specific look was not the natural state of clothing. For one, the tunic would have to be cleaned quite regularly. The routine process would be a simple water rinse and dry. However, a deeper clean involved a fooling method, where stale urine and sulfur would be used to clean or bleach clothes. Often this was carried out by slaves in large tubs within special facilities. As far as we can tell, it did not produce stinky clothes, and the items that came out were considered to be in better condition than when they went in. Pure white was therefore accepted as a high quality tunic and may even have been worn by officers for their special dinner attire. As for the third form of tunic used in battle, we can't say much else. Some think that it may have also been white, for the reasons stated, or hues of red, but ultimately little can be said definitively. On top of these tunics might be worn a sagum, or thick woolen cloak, fastened around the neck with a brooch. Colors likely varied widely, but would have followed the same economic and cultural principles we laid out. A special subtype, the peludamentum, was a cloak worn by officers as a point of distinction. These would be more striking visually, and seem to have been white, blue, scarlet, crimson, and purple. And finally, we have the coloration of the shield. On this, I don't have much to say, other than to point out that we know that there were a variety of different shield pattern designs. There appears to have been at least some amount of uniformity on the unit or legion level, 
but we don't know exactly how that applied to colors and emblems, nor how strictly it was followed. Finally, we can now turn to the Imperial Era, where we see the highest degree of standardization with the Roman army finally becoming a true professional force. Here, unit identity and rank became much more important and well defined to the point that in the late empire, you get contemporary authors chronicling all the various legionary forces and their standards. On top of this, there are macro level economic and political forces that have changed. Roman industry for instance becomes quite advanced with the mass production of goods and the use of intricate logistical systems often set up specifically for the military. Items which were once produced as one-offs from shops now came delivered as large shipments of a standard design. In addition, you also had imperial control and regulation of key sectors and goods. Things like the production of Tyrian dye was now tightly controlled in addition to policing who could wear what. All this essentially to say that we have more reason to believe that Roman armies of this period had a greater degree of uniformity in their appearance. For example, Vegetius mentions that naval forces wore blue tunics. But again, it's not clear to what extent this was true across all forces. Much is up for debate. Some have argued though, that if tunics were indeed mass produced, then they likely would have been white or slightly off-white red for cheap production and cleaning. Later on, we see these same tunics accented by bands of various kinds, which may have been used as an easy way to designate rank. When it comes to shield designs, we can expect them to be subject to the same trends. However, it's a bit more likely that these would have been standardized owing to just how visible they were in battle. If you're going to pick something to align on, focusing on the shield just brings the most bang for your buck. This idea is reinforced by a passage from Vegetius, who writes about the Imperial Army, saying, quote, Lest the soldiers in the confusion of battle should be separated from their comrades, every cohort had its shields painted in a manner peculiar to itself. The name of each soldier was also written on his shield, together with the number of the cohort and century to which he belonged. So from this we know, or at least can claim to know, that every cohort of 480 men painted their shields in a similar way to distinguish themselves, and each century of 80 within the cohort added further identifiers. This apparent standardization could actually be exploited when we hear of soldiers infiltrating enemy lines simply by wearing some of their own shields. While these snippets are certainly useful, unfortunately our ancient authors don't share much in terms of actual colors. I know it's quite common to see certain legions associated with colors like red, blue, and purple, or to see auxiliaries associated with green, but to my knowledge, I don't think any of this is grounded in any actual primary sources, and has instead grown out of stacked assumptions over the years to the point where it seems authoritative. In reality, we just don't know much beyond a few of the shields found at Dura Europus, or in our copies of the Notitia Dignitatum, which may or may not be representative of other time periods. If we were to speculate here, we'd likely just be rehashing the same socio-economic discussions about pigments from before. That is to say, we should likely expect a range of colors to be present, with maybe a slight preference for red. I could go on and on with speculation, but unfortunately this is really where the historical understanding on the subject is at. It's a big case of we don't really know for sure. Yet while this might seem unsatisfactory, for me it's quite useful for resetting my preconceptions. One thing for sure is that we should not expect to walk out of a time machine and see a Roman army fully decked out in bright red everything, as sometimes gets depicted in pop culture. Instead, we should be ready to see a range of colors with all sorts of idiosyncrasies in the gear. Perhaps this one soldier can't afford to get his tunic cleaned, and it's a bit browner than the rest. Maybe this man over here has a washed out hand-me-down. Maybe that officer there has a particular association with a religious cult that favors green and dresses accordingly. If you take anything away from this video, I'd say it's the understanding that reality is far messier than we'd like it to be, and you shouldn't be afraid to question long-standing assumptions that would say otherwise. Anyways, that's about it for my long-winded discussion of a tiny but fascinating subject. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a thing or two. A big thanks to the patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists who made this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these related videos. See you in the next one.